I thank you very much for the invitation. We're very happy to be able to share some of our thinking with a broader audience. Uh, first of all, just to check, you can see my presentation now, right? Great. Okay. So, um, yeah, so to set the background, I suppose, I'll start with the historical problem statement that motivated all of this thinking. And my, a lot of my research has to do with the 11th century in the Near East, in Byzantium and Armenia and Syria and so on. And if you ask, let's say, a regular person on the street what the 11th century was like, then they're probably going to tell you that it was a time of limited travel and even more limited knowledge about others. But on the other hand, if you read works by people like Jonathan Shepard and Peter Frankopan, then you'll hear them, you'll see them talking about it being a time of unprecedented mobility, of increasing prosperity, and um, where, where lots of different people were coming into contact with lots of different other sorts of people. And this seems rather strange for those of us who were taught in school that one of the causes of the First Crusade going wrong was the, the mutual ignorance of East and West about each other. So what's the story? Views on this clearly differ. And I can give a particularly sharp example looking at two publications by two well-respected scholars, both of which were published within the last 20 years, one of which is from a Western medieval background and the other from Byzantine studies, broadly speaking. On the one hand, we have Thomas Asbridge saying, you know, here, which is to say where Pope Urban was born, as in the rest of Europe, he says, even nobles could expect to live their entire lives without traveling more than 100 kilometers from home. And then on the other hand, we have Jonathan Shepard writing in 2017, saying, talking about this quickening of long distance trading and written communications and ever more frequent face-to-face -face encounters of Western Christians with Easterners and Muslims and also pagans in Scandinavia and Rus. So how do you reconcile these things? Now it's possible that this particular discrepancy arises from a disproportionate focus in our modern Western world on events within Western Europe at the time. Now this is understandable for those of us Westerners who um, are interested in our own history and from the perspective of a Western search for the roots of the crusading movement, which is so significant in our culture. But from outside Western Europe, this focus on what was going on in Western Europe in the 11th century seems maybe a little bit parochial because the, these places in Western Europe that would be the heartlands of the crusading movement as yet, they were not anywhere near the center of gravity of the Christian world. Consider the East, you have Byzantium, extremely populous, especially Constantinople. When I, when I tell my Western medievalist friends about the population of places like Constantinople in the 11th century, they don't believe me because they can't imagine that the world had that many people at that time. And yet, you have Syria, you have the Caucasus. You can also consider the North. There's this, these comparatively vast territories that are undergoing a fairly recent process of Christianization. And you can even consider the Holy Land, which was not under Christian rule, but was nevertheless a focal point of devotion and pilgrimage, especially pilgrimage, from all over Christendom. So one of the motivating questions of this talk is how do we integrate such complex and differently perceived pictures of the reality of the 11th century Christian world? So, I should, give you, I should give a warning and sort of a, a request here, because in this talk, we're going to be talking about problems and methods and approaches, but we're not yet talking about solutions because we still have a lot of open questions and we're just beginning and we're very open to brainstorming um, how we can make this better. So I'm not going to be able to answer the question I just posed about how do we integrate all these pictures. At least I won't for the next few years, but I'm gonna talk about how we can how, how we're thinking of approaching this integration of information with digital methods. So on the one hand, the integration of all of these different regional pictures needs all the help it can get. And when we're talking about vast volumes of small pieces of information that don't obviously cohere with each other, then computers and digital data would seem to be a really obvious and useful means of approach. And indeed, there are quite a few digital resources and an ever-expanding amount of information that can be accessed online 
but the integration is so far to a large extent not really there. It's tempting to see this as merely a technical problem because the semantic web is after all about the linking together of lots of different sorts of information. There's been an awful lot of work on vocabularies, standards, ontologies, linked open data repositories to try to get all these pieces of information connected with each other. But a closer look at how these resources are used or not used as the case may be, suggests that the problem is not just a technical one, but it's a more fundamental problem. The semantic web was conceived in the modern day for cases where the facts are both unambiguous and available. So for example, the, I think the classic example is um, the dentist's opening is our 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. The, the traffic flow looks like this. My calendar has these six meetings, autonomous device, schedule a dentist appointment for me. That's the sort of thing that, that was in the mind of people like Tim Berners-Lee when they, when they came up with the idea of the semantic web. But this assumption of the facts being unambiguous and available breaks down massively when we try to record things about history, especially, for example, the sort of history that I work on. I'll hand over to James to make this point a little bit more. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we, yes, slide shift, good. Um, so yeah, and uh, as Sarah was saying, one of the issues with the uh, kind of background of where computing ontologies have come from and information ontologies generally is that they tend to be built around this singular construction of there is one crystal clear reality and this is an ontology to describe that. Ontologies don't have to do that. That's not a necessary feature of an ontology. Um, but the majority of ontologies that are used in practice are frequently built around that model. Um, so if you look at, for example, the Simigi project, um, that has a very declarative approach to there's a birth date, there's a death date. Um, the default approach in something like Sodoc CRM is also um, perhaps more complex in structure, but again, has a defined birth event. Um, and the expectation is somebody has one of these. Um, this is to some extent what we often want out of history. Uh, when we read historical information, when other people read our work on history, a lot of the time they want to know what happened um, and they want an answer to that. However, what the issue is there is that um, is that we don't necessarily have that crystal clarity in our sources. And so when we do come up with those answers, they need to come with a sense of argumentation and a sense of build up and a sense of actually fitting the pieces together to say, this is our best idea of what went on, rather than a that sort of quite flatly declarative approach. Um, uh, can we, yeah, um, and then, the alternative to this, which has also been done, is using an approach which instead of saying, here's a crystal clear idea of what happened, just says, this is what people said happened, here's a collection of all of it, do what you will with the results. Um, so the classic example of this, which is especially used on, in prosopography, historical person data, which is the area I most work on, is the idea of a factoid model. A factoid is an assertion that a source says something about a person uh, or place or whatever. Um, so the factoid model does not absolutely and inherently have any statement about whether that thing is true or might be true or how reliable it is. It's just saying the source says this. Um, and the idea is to then refrain from having any idea of um, a singular narrative and just to represent all the possible information and then allow people to draw their own conclusions which has a lot of utility, especially when you're trying to index primary sources around particular people or concepts. Um, but on the other hand, that can be frustrating for people, uh, including other historians, because they look at this wealth of information that's been put together and they don't necessarily have the information there to sift through it in an effective way. Um, you know, we, when you have a block of Byzantine material on 
the Byzantine Empire, and you have a scattered bunch of material from uh, Persia or Georgia on the Byzantine Empire, most of the time the Byzantines are likely to have a bit more knowledge of Byzantine politics. But a factoid model not only doesn't have that consideration, it, it sort of definitionally can't, that's not what it's designed to do. So these are two different and possibly even opposed approaches to the problem of representing information um, and the problem of what does having a record in your database fundamentally mean? Is your database record saying this is an assertion that was made or is it saying this is a thing that happened? Um, and finding ways to improve people's understanding of what we're putting in our databases um, and to reconcile those issues um, is a problem that uh, we have in various ways been trying to work on. Um, so one possibility, um, and here we come to my own work, is for a digital resource to do what our non-digital resources do, which is to present a single case as per a sort of more classical ontology, but build it into a more argumentative format that is more um, that is more familiar to and therefore perhaps comfortable to a historian. So this is from my protobiography of high medieval Georgia database. Um, and the solution here is to present a single argued reading from the source material, um, which is quite a powerful approach in many ways. It resolves quite a number of issues around you know how do you handle different things well if you can't handle them in a well that because the the fundamental purpose of it is that you have effectively argued articles and then structured data based on them so you and those things are closely linked and stored together in the data set so that when people look at the structured data um, they can easily get back to, this is how I put it together, this is the argumentation that it's based on. Um, and so it captures some of the things that can't be readily expressed as simple statements about entities and properties. For example, when one needs to argue things that are based on lacunae in the sources, um, or things that are based on comparisons uh, between a wide range of different source material. And one of the things you can do with this that on the other hand you can't do with the factoid approach is do things like the rather pretty little map that we have here. Uh, so here the yellow points uh, represent uh, places where a guy called Zakaria Makhagadzeli appears in the database. He was an Armino Georgian general in the 12th century. Blue is uh, Yuri, uh, the first husband of the Georgian queen Tamar, and red is her second husband, David Soslan, and the colour overlaps are sort of as you'd logically expect where they overlap. Um, and so, for example, we can see from this that there's a much higher intensity in a lot of the areas that are now Armenia of activity by this specific Armino Georgian general, and both of Tamar's husbands are comparatively sort of um, either relegated or prefer to deal with the problems on Georgia's other two border areas. Um, but this requires us to have um, to have disambiguated that material. You can't do this with a factoid system or a system that doesn't attempt to make any judgment between assertions, precisely because you can't produce a sensible map where people are in the same are in multiple places at the same time, or where they have died three times. I have three different death dates for Tamar in my sources. Uh, she can't have died three times um, if you want a reading that people will consider broadly plausible. But whilst this approach is really helpful for um, historical information, there are things it can't do. And the primary thing it can't do because of that single constructed reading approach is that it can't compare different lines of argumentation. And this is where we can we move on to our the future work the rest of this talk is going to be about um, because digital media can do a huge amount with presenting and visualizing different sorts of information um, and where we have disagreements over past reality uh, it's clearly desirable to have uh, 
more concretized ways of displaying and therefore discussing and analyzing those. Um, so uncertainty is one of the major problems here. Um, where we have those aforementioned multiple death dates for someone, um, how do we say what we think the probable reality or probable plausible constructed past is? There are some approaches that try to quantify this uncertainty uh, and say, well, I think there's about a 50% chance it's this one, about a 50% chance it's this one. The trouble with that, though, is that uncertainty is firstly very hard to quantify. When I say I think this is about 50-50, I'm really putting quite an arbitrary set of numbers onto that. But also historians, when they're making these claims, are often pretty certain. It's not the case that if I think something and Tara thinks the other thing, that that means there is a 50-50 chance because there's one historian on either side. That's just not a logical progression. I may be entirely certain that my answer is right, and Tara may be entirely certain that her answer is right. So even when historians disagree, there may be multiple competing certainties. And here we have your the kind of classic elephant metaphor. One person is certain the elephant is a rope and the other person is certain it's a snake, because perhaps because they're looking at different parts of it, but also perhaps because there are you know, genuinely different theories and different philosophies that are resulting in those claims. So just because something is an assertion doesn't necessarily mean it's contested. I mean, there are some assertions that basically everybody reasonably agrees on um, in most historical fields, but almost any assertion could be contested. Somebody may well come back afterwards um, and this thing that's been the groundwork of a bunch of theories for a century, somebody comes back and is actually, you know, I've done some more manuscript work on this and I think that this has been mistranslated. This is a, and so you can actually, uh, have you know novel conflicting assertions coming forward in the literature, and here we move on to our um, sort of the start of our um, ideas on this. Uh, the core of which is the star model, the structured assertion record. So as we've uh, we've had mention of triples already today um, with this sort of subject predicate object system. Uh, but when historians encounter this sort of information, um, then provenance and authority start coming into the picture. So this kind of linked open data triple format is a very popular thing for collections of any sort of information, cultural heritage included. Um, on the other hand, it was designed without controversy in mind. Um, and as, for example, uh, Card and Simon, uh, Simon um, argue in an upcoming paper, those bits of disagreement, those controversy bits, tend to get dissociated very quickly from their context. And so here is the start of a solution. If you keep at the data level the authority and source attached to that triple in the star model as shown on the screen, then perhaps we can come towards solutions. And uh, now Tara will uh, take away for some more uh, detail on that. Okay. Yeah, so so basically, you know, as a historian, when I see something like, you know, Alexius Komnenos was born on the 15th of August, 1048, I want to know who is saying that, and I want to know on what basis they're saying that. So we're, try we're trying to work out an idea for how this would work. And so we start with a typical linked open data model. So here's an example over, over on the side that there is a, there's a, um, a Latin mercenary who was, who was active in the East in the mid 11th century called Hervé, also known as Frangopoulos, son of the Frank in the sources. And um, you will find in various places that he died in 1063 or 1064, which is to say the Armenian year 512, which starts in about March, 1063. And that, in fact, he was executed. Um, he was executed by the emperor. This is this is the claim that you will see in a typical leaked open database, leaked, leaked, open, leaked open data store, if they have mentioned about Frangopoulos at all, because that is that is the sort of typical thing that circulates. You don't know where this information comes from because I haven't told you yet. 
Um, we're missing who claims this and we're missing on what grounds. So this means that we have to, you know, to, uh, Stin mentioned reification somewhere near the beginning in, in the introduction. And this is something that has to be done because this predicate has to be reified in order to be able to link it to any kind of further contextualizing information. You can't, you can't, um, you can't have a property linked to anything without without turning it into an actual entity. And so this and so this makes the predicate able to have its own properties or able to be a property of something else, such as this is this is the assertion that we're making. That's that's the first thing we have to do. And then we attach in some way or another our authority and our provenance information. So what might this look like? Here's a fairly simple example. So we have the, the statement together with the authority and the provenance, which is to say uh, Gerard Derian in his, um, in his massive two volume tome on the, um, on the Armenians um, in the, you know, between Greeks, Muslims and Crusaders, which, which he wrote, in, I think he, it was published in 2001 or so. And he mentions, he, you know, it's actually a really astonishing work of scholarship because he mentions everyone who can be mentioned who was in the Armenian world during this time and sort of collects all of the ev evidence that he has for them. And for him, this is very simple. Matthew Videssa says in his book that, uh, in his chronicle, that uh, Frankopoulos was recalled after, after the emperor found out that he had been responsible for the death of another general and, um, and a, a stone was tied around his neck and he was thrown into the sea, apparently was how he died. And then that this happened um, presumably right after the emperor found out about the death of this other person in 1063 or 1064. Um, so in this case, and Dedeon makes, you know, Dedeon seems to accept this. And so he's recorded here as the authority. He, say, he says in the footnote that this is on the basis of that particular passage of Matthew of Edessa. Um, but here is a conflicting assertion based on a different source. Um, in this case, Werner Zeib has got has come into possession of a seal, which is, which has been, apparently he has his own personal collection of, of Byzantine lead seals, which is awesome. But um, according to the inscription on the seal, Frangopoulos is named, and he's named with a title and in a context that Zeib believes quite clearly dates it after the famous Battle of Manzikert in 1071, meaning that Frangopoulos must have still been alive and active in the wake of Manzikert and taking control of taking control of the so-called decapitated armies of the East. And so this is another assertion. It's a conflicting assertion. And, and we know that this assertion, you know, the, the authority is Werner Zeib and the the on what, what he's basing it on is the inscription on this particular seal. So like in the factoid model, it's up to the user to decide who to trust. But unlike in the factoid model, the user does not have to evaluate every single statement in isolation. The user can choose the authorities, which is to say the historians making claims, or the sources that are trusted because the, the user can see both of these things. And in the factoid model, of course, you can see the source, but you don't see, you don't see anyone, you know, any modern scholar willing to say, willing to um, make the argument for a particular source statement. And you can filter these statements in accordingly. So one of the first obvious questions we wanted to answer for ourselves was how, if at all, this fits into existing models. And in fact, the problem of conflicting assertions has been getting an increasing amount of work in the last few years. Uh, there was a relevant re revision to CIDOC CRM published in 2019. And there was an extension proposing an argumentation model called CRM INF that was already published in a preliminary form in 2015, although I don't know if there's been any work on it done since. And so in um, inside, you know, so so our, our assertion model can map reasonably readily so far. We this might this might change depending on the, the outcome of various brainstorming to what's inside of CRM. So the subject and object can be any sort of entity. Um, as of 2019, you can reify predicates. They become E55 types, I believe. And um, yeah, and then you can use these P140, P141, and P77 to make the assertion into a generic attribute assignment. 
Now, there are various subclasses of attribute assignment that make it clear that this was conceived for assigning attributes to museum objects. But like so many historians who encounter Sidoc CRM, I'm trying to see if I can make some of the concepts work with things that are not museum objects. We'll see how well it works. And then we can, and then the assertion can be carried out by someone because it's event, and it can be motivated by something. Um, I think also because, because an attribute assignment is a subclass of an event. Um, and you can map this to CRM inf by saying that the attribute assignment is in particular an argumentation or an observation. So this is, this is something that can help us in trying to model what an assertion is that might become useful. So our group has been engaging in a small pilot project over the last year to test the feasibility of this approach to modeling historical information. And one of the immediate questions that arose was, okay, we've got this enormous database of factoids in, in the form of the Byzantine prosopography. So can, how easy or hard is it to convert a set of factoids into a set of structured assertions? And it turns out, thanks to the foresight of Charlotte Roche, who made a list of the scholars involved in the PBW project and it attached names of scholars to the names of sources they analyzed, it's to a degree, it's actually pretty straightforward because we have the information of which source this information is coming from and we have the information of who read that source to interpret that information and make that factoid into the database. Uh, so for the purpose of the pilot, we were able to directly convert almost all of the, the different types of factoid. Now, narrative factoids are a little more complex as this diagram shows. Um, they're linked in the PBW database to narrative units, and narrative units are overarching episodes that house a set of related statements across different sources. And these, PB, these narrative units are themselves assigned to a year. Um, and I should, I should stop and say that if any of you were getting your hopes up that we were going to present some kind of brilliant solution for a formal digital model for historical events, I'm sorry to have to disappoint you. Um, we, we have not got that far. Um, a lot of people have spent a lot of time trying to work on models for historical events. And for now, um, we are budging it in the case of PBW taking over their narrative factoids and their narrative units. Um, we're, we would, we would love to, um, profit from the insights of anyone who is working on event modeling. And maybe over the next few years, we will even be able to contribute our own ideas. But in any case, this conversion, the fact that the narrative factoids were not tied, or none of, the, none of the factoids are actually tied to any dating, but the narrative factoids are tied to narrative units and the other factoids are tied to sources that appear in narrative units. And, um, and so it means that if you use PBW data directly, you can, for example, get a list of all the places a person is documented to have been because that's a location factoid. But the location factoid is not tied to a year. Um, so you can't make this an ordered list of places they've been, or you can't even straightforwardly find out in which year a person was in a particular place. This is kind of, kind of a shame for, for using the PBW data. In fact, the only common link between undated location factoids and data, dated narrative units, which contain narrative factoids, will be the specification of the source material, the, the particular source reference where the information came from. While this is perhaps not so helpful for the common user, it presented for us the opportunity to play around with how we might make automated inference, inferences over an existing set of assertions. So we can, we can start to sort of do a little bit of automatic detective work and make a first rough draft of tying years with location factoids based on the particular source snippet that the information is, is claimed to have to from. And this seems, this seems in theory to work, although it certainly needs a lot, of, a lot of checking, but it's one way that we can start to experiment with doing a little bit of inference over historical information as it's been given to us where that information is missing. Now the data types that we can handle are also fairly wide ranging. Factoid databases have tended to prioritize direct assertions made by historical te texts themselves. Um, as we develop our model, we want to be able to consider assertions made on the basis of other source material besides text and descriptions, maybe arguments from art history, arguments from architecture, environmental history, numismatics, for example. 
or even other mechanisms of argument, as James mentioned, inferences that are drawn for, from combining sources or discussing lacunae or proposed um, assertion is not directly stated by a text, but we can infer it anyway. I think James's classic example is that um, when you're reading a Georgian historical chronicle, it will not tell you that mo for most of the people it will not tell you their nationality. It only tells you their nationality if it's away from the default and the default is Georgian. So in a factoid model, you cannot record that most of these people are Georgians, but in an assertion model, you can because you have an authority who is making that statement and you're, you're able to attack some sort, you know, we have still have to, we still have a lot of work to do on modeling provenance, but you should be able to model this argument from default um, to, to, make, to, make the, um, to make the assertion. But um, this, let's see. Yeah, so this experiment also brought up an interesting question, which is still an open question because actually we did the PBW pilot data and we made all of these people that Charlotte Roche had named and shamed, and shamed into authorities. But many of the scholars who worked on the PBW project, myself included, would be quite upset to think that we're over here staking our professional reputation on some absurd claim in a primary source that everyone knows isn't really true just because we happen to be the scholars who read that source and injected its factoids into the database. So that raises the question, what do we do with these bogus factoids, these statements that are definitely in a source but no historian accepts that statement today is true. Now, of course, there's merit in recording them. After all, they often provide clues to the agenda of the chronicler. In some cases, they can be built into arguments for what a scholar does believe happened on the basis that the chronicler was an error in a particular sort of way. For example, in our, um, in our example of earlier, what if Matthew of Edessa was right that the emperor had Frangopoulos executed but the emperor was actually Michael the Seventh, and the offense was his unauthorized assumption of command in the East after the Battle of Manzikert, or his support for the deposed emperor Romanos the Fourth after that battle. Maybe, maybe we will find some evidence that says Matthew was, you know, he had the wrong end of the stick, but he, his his um, his statement was not based on thin air; it was based on some actual reality behind it that he just misunderstood. And so, in these cases, we need to find a way to distinguish the claims, distinguish the sorts of claims a scholar is actually making. And I have given a few examples on the set, on the slide of the differences in shade of claims that a scholar can be making. Um, I will stake my authority on the claim that Matthew says in his text that Frangopoulos was executed by the emperor after the death of this other guy in 1063. Um, but I also would accept Zeib's argument that Frangopoulos must have been alive after the Battle of Manzikert, and thus I would join what, what professional reputation or authority I have to the claim that Frangopoulos must have died after 1071. And this, also, this question also brings up the question that we're still debating and we're very happy to engage with in the discussion, which is what exactly constitutes an authority? Can a medieval writer like Matthew of Edessa be an authority? Or can we, only base our modern, can only modern people be authority taking into account a text that happens to be attributed to a person called Matthew de Dessa. So, you know, is Matthew a person who is an authority or is Matthew a document that someone is reading and interpreting and saying on their authority, this is what it says. Um, can an inscription on a seal be con constitute an authority? How do we avoid endlessly recursive chains of assertions, for example, you assert that you understand me to be saying that I assert that I read Dedeyan to be claiming on the basis that he understands Matthew's text to be saying that Frangopoulos was executed in 1063. Now, all this said, experiments wouldn't be experiments if we didn't have a few different people taking a few different test cases and seeing what they make of it. So with that, I'm going to turn over first to Dan and then to Maxim to discuss their own modeling exercises and the questions that arose from their exercises as they did them. So. Uh, yeah, so um, the test case I was um, presented with to, to take a look at and to try and, you know, not only 
pull apart some assertions but also model them was um, the account of the Battle of Mamistra in um, uh, Ralph of Cain, Albert of Arkin and, and William of Tyre's uh, narratives of the event. Um, how I approached this to begin with was I constructed a, a couple of um, simplified narrative schemas for each text and, and laid these schemas side by side so that the narratives of each text and conflicts between them could be examined more clear, clearly. And what I wanted to identify in this in this test case um, was a point in the narrative where assertions made by each text came into conflict so that we could better understand the relationship between modeling an event and modeling the assertions um, various sources made about um, an event. Um, and in this example, the major narrative uh, differences came over the assertions about who started the conflict. So in Albert of Arkin's uh, narrative, it's um, Tancred being incited by Richard of Salerno to attack uh, Baldwin's force outside the city of Mimistra in retaliation for uh, Baldwin's actions previously uh, in Tarsus. Um, in Ralph of Kahn's uh, ass assertion, the conflict emerged from disagreements among the soldiers of the two armies, inflaming pre-existing tensions, and William of Tyre's assertions follow the lead of Albert of Arkin, and we might consider these a single set of assertions, and this is a problem I'll talk about in a moment. I then attempted to fit these assertions into a star model. Um, this raised a number of issues th uh, for me, resulting from both how I read the text and how I modeled the assertions. Um, and an ongoing issue um, that I came across is how to model the event that these assertions refer to without privileging one assertion over the other so that the discourse that they represented can be preserved. So I guess my, 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 first, my first issue is, is, who, is who's making the assertion, coming back to the point Tara has just been discussing. Um, and the model now on the screen represents um, the assertion from the point of view of, of Ralph of Kahn. And the representing that the, the 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 cause of the battle was the the um, the encouragement of, of Richard of Salerno to attack for, for Tancred to attack Baldwin. And here, my reading of the text affects my modelling of the assertion. Um, you know, firstly, when deciding who the authority is here, is it Albert of Arkin, or do I consider the author to be dead? And, the authority is the reader of the text that is that is myself um, and in following this as well you know where the province provenance is is it the author of the text the text or a source referred to in the text um, all of these were possibilities when i tried to map um, out this particular model the other issue i came across was um, what to do with repeated assertions uh, in a model. And here we have a, a, an assertion modelled based on the narratives of Albert of Arkin and, and William of Tyre. There are two types of repeated assertion that we might consider. Similar assertions made by multiple sources independent of each other, and assertions repeated by sources that draw upon one another, as is the case in, in, in this um, account where William of Tyre seems to be using Albert of Arkin as a source. Again, another assertion might need to be made there to, in the model. Um, we could treat every assertion on its own merits um, and model similar assertions as they occur in separate but related texts. Uh, this could produce a plethora of substantively similar and related assertions, which might cloud our overall model of our overall model. We could exclude duplicate assertions of later writers, but this might be incredibly drastic and, and privilege assertions just because of their 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 age um, or, or supposed um, origin point um, and would sort of take away a lot of useful data on the longevity and reuse of assertions in later texts. Another option might be also to do what I've done here and sort of block model the assertions and in this case I've given two sort of uh, provenances to the assertion um, that I am making here as the authority. And that is that both of these assertions come from um, Albert of Arkin and William, a reading of Albert of Arkin and William of Tyre. But again, there are problems here in that we lose some of the nuance of each individual assertion in turn. Um, and the third issue that I came across is how do conflicting assertions fit together? That is, how do we sort of create events versus, uh, from the discourse about events um, that we have here modeled here? 
with the conflicting assertions do while conflicting assertions do have links um, through some of their parts um, here we could look at the subjects and predicates of each of these models and see that they are here the same you know, how do we form an event from this you know perhaps we need to have more assertions um, and how and, and think about how much detail we need to go into here um, and how many different assertions we can stack into but um, this is also an issue that uh, maxims uh, I think has faced here as well and he can uh, continue the discussion okay so um, um, I will talk about a couple of a couple of other examples uh, that that directly related to the work that I do I focus on um, I'm an Arabist I'm working with Islamic sources written in Arabic and um, the um, the example that I looked at here was um, <clears throat> includes concluding descriptions of what can be <clears throat> considered um, the same events um, uh, as they were presented by the Western Christian author William of Tyre versus um, how they're presented by an Arab Muslim author, Ibn Rathir. So <clears throat> William of Tyre gives an account of the, um, of the fight between Qutbuddin of Mosul, <coughs> excuse me, the brother of uh, Nur uh, and uh, and Saladin of Salahuddin in uh, 1150, uh, so, sorry, 1175. Um, and uh, um, the count, uh, the count goes as follows. Uh, can Tar, can you click? Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> so Kutbuddin heard of the death of Nuruddin and and uh, that Salahuddin had uh, uh, forgotten all the benefits conferred on him by Nuruddin and had rebelled against his immature lord, the son of Nuruddin. Sorry, there is a lot of Arabic names, but I hope you can you can bear with me. Um, on hearing the plight of Ismail, Kutbuddin gathered large force, crossed the Euphrates, and came to bring on help to his nephew. He pitched the camp near Aleppo. <clears throat> and uh, when the Christians retreated, Salahuddin provoked him into a major battle, and Kutbuddin was defeated. So here we have we have a kind of like a, um, a sort of a nice nice narrative. But as we go to uh, the way Ibn Lathir, um, the Arab historian who um, was actually quite privy into what was going on there, um, we find a rather different story. So first of all, um, Qutbuddin um, uh, actually dies five years ago at Mosul um, of a violent fever. And uh, he was succeeded by his son, Saif al um, Nuruddin dies a year before um, um, to, to what we find in William of Tyre. Um, <clears throat> and uh, actually people in Syria, as well as Salahuddin himself in Egypt, um, offered their obedience to, uh, uh, to uh, Nuruddin's um, son Ismail. Um, later that year, Salahuddin does put Aleppo under siege. Ismail writes to his cousin, uh, Saifuddin, son of Qutbuddin, to cross the Euphrates and attack Salahuddin. Um, Saifuddin gets stuck uh, in a conflict with his brother who refuses to go with him. Um, <clears throat> but uh, later, uh, eventually, both brothers uh, team up together, go to Aleppo, confront Salahuddin. Um, and after uh, failed attempts of Salahuddin to negotiate with them, the war starts, and, and, but both brothers are defeated. So um, what we get here is uh, quite different versions of, of what happened. Um, were, uh, and and uh, who were the main authors, not to mention that actually um, uh, other more nuanced details in this, in this kind of two completely complete narratives. But what we're getting is that to kind of, again, to sum up quickly, one person, a specific person, the uncle of um, uh, heir, an heir apparent, uh, goes against uh, famous Saladin on his own uh, to protect his nephew, but he is defeated. In Ibn Arathir, that person actually is already dead. And it, it is his sons who are getting involved into this conflict, but not on their own by, 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 by invitation of uh, the heir of uh, Nuruddin, and they got defeated. So um, essentially what we're getting here is that someone fights Salahuddin at Aleppo at, uh, um, in 1175. Um, and, and the question is that how can we, um, how can we uh, get further with this? So uh, we can use a st this, the star model to tease out these narratives into assertions, which can then be, be more efficiently compared and analyzed. We can filter and cluster them. 
uh, the, these assertions in, in, in a variety of ways to get, to get a better understanding of what's going on both historically and historiographically. Um, and in a rather simplified manner, this can look as follows. So we have, we have an assertion <coughs> uh, based on William Mokhtari that Kubuddin fought Salahuddin at uh, Taleb in uh, uh, 1175. Then number two, we have the assertion that um, uh, two brothers, two sons of Kutbuddin actually, fought Salahuddin at Aleppo in 1175. And we have uh, a kind of an, an, another assertion that clarifies the relationship between those two conflicting is that, well, actually the guy, the guy died uh, before that. Um, so it couldn't, couldn't have been, uh, couldn't have been Kutbuddin. So, <clears throat> um, this assertion should allow us to go back to narratives of specific sources, as well as to compare representations of specific events, which I, which I find particularly valuable and interesting. Um, for instance, from these assertions, <clears throat> if we look at number three and two, we can regard that the Kutbuddin dies first and then the battle takes place. Number one and two um, give us uh, the different perspective on, on what happened in, Le in Aleppo in, in 1175. Um, what would be interesting to see then that I, I kind of uh, going into you know into what what I can can get from these uh, um, uh, recordings from these assertions um, as a historian is whether we can discover broader patterns in writing of our medieval historians um, for uh, for example patterns of how specific kinds of events are described perhaps to make distinctions between more of a historical writing versus more of a literary presentation. And um, why I'm talking about this is when I was uh, looking at, William, at the way William of Tyre is, is presenting these events, um, what's interesting is actually what can be called, let's say, literary tepoi um, kind of coincides with what we find in Ibala Theater. So um, um, things like being un uh, ungrateful toward the deceased Nuruddin, crossing the Euphrates, helping against the traitor, uh, Christians retreating, and defender of Ismail being defeated. But he gets um, all the names and, and of, of the actors and dates confused and blurred together. So that's, 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 that's kind of, it's, that's the um, interesting perspectives that we get, uh, we can get from this. Um, and the second example that I'd like to talk about is, um, is on kind of scaling, trying to figure out how we can scale this approach up because uh, again, that's my, my primary interest because I'm working with this uh, insanely large Arabic um, biographical sources and chronicles. So um, uh, here, the slides show you the scale of data available in Arabic sources and chronicles actually are not even shown here. So here we have a graph of about 200 biographical texts and how they uh, distribute chronologically the, the, the red uh, uh, frame shows uh, how many sources we have for, uh, written in the 11th century, um, and uh, the largest amount of them uh, comes arguably from the from the Mamluk period. And even though they're later, they are, they actually are quite important for the earlier period because they may preserve they do preserve a lot of information that didn't survive, didn't come to us from from earlier sources. Um, and uh, the next slide gives you an idea of the number of biographical. Uh, I'm sorry, um, a scale of biographical data. So uh, in this biographical data, there are already over 500,000 biographical records. And again, this is a, they show a kind of a chronological distribution based on sources. And again, you can see that <clears throat> they, they, uh, for the 11th century, there is some 55,000 biographies um, and, and uh, uh, there's a huge number of biographies survives um, in, in the Mamluk uh, sources for, from the later period. And uh, <clears throat> Um, what I find kind of interesting and potentially very, very valuable is the, the automation and scaling up of our, um, uh, sorry, um, and scaling up of our star model promises interest case, interesting cases um, uh, of distant reading. In particular, um, oh, again, this will be valuable for this massive sources. Um, and, and uh, uh, the scale for the description of events, um, um, sorry, um, uh, things are starting, starting popping up on my, on my screen and, and, and got a little, a little bit distracted. <clears throat> um, the sheer size of this massive sources of recorded historical information um, forces us use, to use um, automated methods of text analysis. And uh, um, uh, while such methods, such methods cannot really generate the deep data like, like what we've looked at um, um, uh, PBW, 
Um, but uh, we can generate broad data where a smaller number of characteristics is collected and automatically integrated from um, an otherwise um, prohibitively large corpus of historical information. Um, <clears throat> and um, with regard to Arabic sources, it's well known feature that they build on each other. They often reuse chunks from earlier sources, um, practically, often practically verbatim. Um, but at the same time, they, the author is often uh, subtly amending and supplementing um, what, they, what they write, what they copy. And the information, the descriptions of the same entities say, uh, may at the core remain quite the same with only a few details changed here and there. Um, and uh, keeping the subtle dif uh, differences apart is, is, is a difficult task. And uh, in the secondary sources, they're often blurred together or completely discarded. So the promise of this, of this star uh, model here would be exactly in this ability to keep the similarities and differences clearly separated and combined with the automated method provide, provide us with the information that would allow us to discern a broader patterns. Um, so, um, one of such cases uh, where uh, we would combine both distant closed reading uh, would be to closely analyze the assertions from different sources about specific uh, historical entity, say someone's biography or description of, a histor of some historical event, and uh, to compare them with broader patterns of si or similarities and differences among these sources in their portrayal um, of all the other shared entities. Um, these results should allow us to distinguish between unique information that's, that is asserted by specific historians and, biograph uh, and biographies versus systematic information uh, that rather reflects the authorial agenda um, in, case of, uh, in case a pattern of similar assertions are discovered and descriptions, um, and descriptions of other entities. Arguably discovered systematic information can help us to contextualize individual assertions uh, within each author's method of writing. And uh, um, while discovered unique information can help us to distinguish reliable information from uh, in what's in, in that survives in uh, in only later sources. So um, that would be all for me. And back to Tara. Okay. So um, so this is sort of an overview of all of the brainstorming that we've been doing within the group for how to handle this problem. And I am very pleased that we're going to get to continue this brainstorming over the next five years. We'll start in mid-2021 with an ERC project 11, where we're going to dig into specific aspects of the 11th century and try to implement a model where all of this actually seems to work. And the ERC project will run from June 2021 for five years. We have three strands in the project. We're gonna be focusing on more prosopographical information in the, in the people and movement strand, as we see, you know, we see what people there, there were and, and um, what, kind, what kind of, you know, how, how mobile they were at the time. We're going to focus in a strand on place and space. Here we're interested in the perceptions of different people in the 11th century of how they define the, the space, the territory around them. For example, was Edessa a Syrian city? Was it an Armenian city? Was it part of Byzantium? Was it Turkish? The, you know, the different people will, different, different um, contemporary people will have had and recorded different opinions of this, of this subject. And the idea is to see if we can come up with different ideas of the geography of the Near East and how that geography, you know, how different people's perspectives of the geography might have conflicted with each other. And then the third strand we'll be looking at is the textual culture. We're interested in what kind of texts were being written, what kind of texts were being transmitted in the 11th century, um, from where to where, on what subjects, written but written by whom, you know, what, what was the textual production like? And through all of these and through, and through modeling all of these tiny scraps of information digitally in a way that we can connect and query it and not lose sight of its context, we hope in that way to be Reevaluating our ideas, these conflicting ideas of the 11th century, and seeing if we can come up with a more coherent picture. Um, if you know any pre-docs or post-docs who are interested in the area or the subject of, of data modeling, then please do send them my way because we will be recruiting very soon. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention and look forward to any discussions.